From this car's age, you can tell how cut off these Armenians were, and from this tractor, how they're fleeing with anything they can. Though some of these coachloads of refugees had just minutes to pack. Yesterday, their breakaway government abolished itself, ending 30 years of self-rule. And if these people look abandoned by the outside world, in many ways, they have been. I don't want to live with the Azerbaijanis or be a resident there. I don't want to return. I choose to stay Armenian. Nagorno-Karabakh means mountainous black garden. It's mystically beautiful and so ancient a homeland that till now Armenians have desperately clung to it, despite regional geopolitics dictating otherwise. There's only one road out, this one and Azerbaijan has had them surrounded for the last nine months before mounting a lightning attack last week. And many Christian Armenians call them Turks, haunted as they are by the trauma of genocide in Ottoman times. We don't want to live with Turks. We don't trust them. My house was bombed, and I left the house with the clothes I am wearing. Both sides have been mourning their dead in the hundreds. In this case, Colonel Vustal Rustamov, who died for Azerbaijan. Though his father said his son feared nothing, not even death itself. 30 years ago, it was the Azerbaijanis who were terrorized and outgunned by an Armenian advance. But those roles have now reversed. Look at these Armenian weapons the Azerbaijanis say they've captured. They're Soviet, almost antique, while Azerbaijan has grown rich on its oil wealth and spent it to train and rearm for battle. Armenia's Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan presides over an economy ten times smaller, but his biggest problem is the Russians further north, who let events unfold last week without getting involved. That may be because Mr. Pashinyan had just finished hosting America's 101st Airborne on a training exercise. And the Kremlin doesn't like the sound of the star-spangled banner drifting across its historical backyard. So this was Russia's revenge. Its peacekeepers sending in aid to Nagorno-Karabakh, but not actually protecting it accepting that Azerbaijan has won, and probably for good, while the West would rather not condemn either when it needs Azerbaijani energy to temper the loss of Russian supply. So these Armenian refugees queuing for aid are pawns in what is far from a game for them. When the war broke out, the children came to me screaming that it started, this woman says. A war everyone knew was bound to start, with too much blood shed over too many years for it to be worth testing Azerbaijan's promise of being just in victory. Jonathan Rugman reporting. Well, joining me now is Alyssa de Carbonel, Deputy Programme Director for Europe and Central Asia at Crisis Group and previously European Security Correspondent for Reuters. Thank you so much for coming in. Watching those tens of thousands of people draining out of Nagorno-Karabakh in recent days packed with their belongings, their livelihoods left behind, and so far relatively few people killed on this route. This seems to be one of the most appalling yet also successful examples of ethnic cleansing that we've seen in recent memory. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely a tragedy that we've seen tens of thousands, you know, almost a third of the population, and there are more people leaving yeah. in the last days. Um, there two thirds, is, right? So it's 90,000 on total out two, of 120. Yeah. Two thirds out of 120. Yeah. It, might, it might well be only a few yeah. people left. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, you know, that's not the end of the story for them. Sure. And it's really essential that uh, Azerbaijan gives them an opportunity to maybe visit, return, uh, to have access to their properties. Yeah. So there's a huge responsibility here on Azerbaijan still. Uh... And see, and the other Azerbaijanis have said quite clearly, if you want to stay, you can stay. You will be fully integrated as an Azerbaijani citizen. What does that mean to those people? And, and why would they not trust that? 
Well, there's now been three wars yeah. um, between them and Azerbaijan. So the trust is very, very low. Also, these people have been living through an effective blockade for the last nine months. Yeah. Where the one route in was was blocked. And so they had shortages of medicine, of food, of, uh, of fuel. So even the evacuations now, people are arriving really hungry. Mm. Some of them have not had bread in days. Um, they, they were waiting for fuel to evacuate. So there's, there's not a lot of terrible, isn't it? But of course, you know, I mean, we've heard this in Jonathan's report and we discussed this with the Azerbaijani ambassador here last week in the studio. You know, the Azerbaijanis were treated, many of them, appallingly by the Armenians when they had the upper hand, you know, after the first war. So there's this kind of historical payback here up to a point, isn't there? Not that it justifies any of it. Well, I mean, so there was a big war in uh, in 2020. It was relatively short, but really vicious, mm. where Azerbaijan took back huge swaths of territory and part of the enclave. There has been an opportunity in the years since to start talks between de facto authorities mm. and Azerbaijan towards how to integrate those people in a territory that's, inter that's internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan. That hasn't happened, and now we're seeing the tragedy um, that we're seeing. It's the brutal fact here as well that one, the Armenians are caught basically in a sandwich made by Vladimir Putin and President Erdogan of Turkey, who's on the side of Azerbaijan. And, there's, and they are armed with, you know, with history, victimhood, and if you like, Bibles, because they're Christians. But what they don't have is oil, and they don't have these two powerful players on their side. I mean, certainly um, the current environment in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is really one in which Russia is distracted. Um, Turkey has already given its full-throated support to Azerbaijan. There are Russian the peacekeepers in Nagorno-Karabakh who've done absolutely nothing, right? They will continue to have an important role to kind of help with humanitarian thing, actions because there's nobody else on the ground, but they have not been able to deter Baku at all. But is that also because Baku's done a deal with the Turks and the Russians to allow this to happen? I don't say that there was any specific deal, but I think that uh, a lot of people in the region knew this was coming. Um, there's a lot of anger among Western diplomats now mm. because they got constant reassurances from Azerbaijan that there would be no resorting to mm. force. Um, clearly, that's been um, not held to and promises have been broken. But for Russia and Turkey, mm. who are well aware sure. of the regional dynamics, I think they knew this was coming. Okay, Elisabeth Kavanaugh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.